There is nothing holding you back in life more than yourself. If there is an ongoing gap between where you are and where you want to be, and your efforts to close it are consistently met with your own resistance, pain, and discomfort, self-sabotage is almost always at work. On the surface, self-sabotage seems masochistic. It appears to be a product of self-hatred, low confidence, or a lack of willpower. In reality, self-sabotage is simply the presence of an unconscious need that is being fulfilled by the self-sabotaging behavior. To overcome this, we must go through a process of deep psychological excavation. We must pinpoint the traumatic event, release unprocessed emotions, find healthier ways to meet our needs, reinvent our self-image, and develop principles such as emotional intelligence and resilience. It is no small task, and yet it is the work that all of us must do at one point or another. Self-sabotage is not always obvious at the onset. When Carl Jung was a child, he fell on the ground in school and hit his head. When he got hurt, he thought to himself, yes, maybe I won't have to go back to school now. Though he is known today for his insightful body of work, he actually didn't like school or fit in well with his peers. Shortly after his accident, Jung began experiencing sporadic and uncontrollable fainting spells. He unconsciously developed what he would call a neurosis and ultimately came to realize that all neuroses are substitutes for legitimate suffering. In Jung's case, he made an unconscious association between fainting and getting out of school. The fainting spells were a manifestation of his unconscious desire to get out of class, where he felt uncomfortable and unhappy. Likewise, for many people, their fears and attachments are very often just symptoms of deeper issues for which they do not have any better way to cope. Self-sabotage is a coping mechanism. Self-sabotage is what happens when we refuse to consciously meet our innermost needs, often because we do not believe we are capable of handling them. Sometimes, we sabotage our relationships because what we really want is to find ourselves, though we are afraid to be alone. Sometimes, we sabotage our professional success because what we really want is to create art, even if it will make us seem less ambitious by society's measures. Sometimes we sabotage our healing journey by psychoanalyzing our feelings, because doing so ensures we avoid actually experiencing them. Sometimes we sabotage our self-talk, because if we believed in ourselves, we'd feel free to get back out in the world and take risks, and that would leave us vulnerable. In the end, self-sabotage is very often just a maladaptive coping mechanism a way we give ourselves what we need without having to actually address what that need is. But like any coping mechanism, it is just that, a way to cope. It's not an answer, it's not a solution, and it does not ever give us what we really need. We are merely numbing our desires, giving ourselves a little taste of temporary relief. Self-sabotage comes from irrational fear. Sometimes, our most sabotaging behaviors are really the result of long-held and unexamined fears we have about the world and ourselves. Perhaps it is the idea that you are unintelligent, unattractive, or disliked. Perhaps it is the idea of losing a job, taking an elevator, or committing to a relationship. In other cases, it can be more abstract, such as the concept of someone coming to get you, violating your boundaries, getting caught, or being wrongly accused. These beliefs become attachments over time. For most people, the abstract fear is really a representation of a legitimate fear.